Thanks for joining us. This is Ears to Hear, a podcast brought to you by the 25th Street Church of Christ in Columbus, Indiana. Check us out online at 25thstreetchurchofchrist.com for directions and meeting times. We appreciate you tuning in. Now, let's get into God's Word with Ears to Hear. We appreciate you joining our broadcast. As usual, my name is John Hines. I am the preacher for the Church of Christ here in Columbus, Indiana. And I have with me... And I'm Andrew Walker, here again. Good, good to see you, Andrew. We have a third guest tonight. Last week we had Brother Chuck Byers, and this evening we have Brother Brace Rutledge. I'm thankful to be here. Appreciate the invitation. Yeah, appreciate you coming on with us, Brace. One of the things that's been in the news today has been the trial that is currently happening up north. Um, a lot of tensions involved with that. And any time there's a trial like that, one of the things that gets discussed is something that a lot of Christians have questions about, and it's the death penalty. Should And the question, start, the question is, should Christians, um, should we frankly support those who believe in the death penalty? Things like that. And I, I just looked up a, a few statistics. In this country, there are some 1.5 million people in prison, roughly. And of those, there are, and it looks like there's right around 2,500 individuals on death row. Hmm. You can actually get online and you can see who they are individually, what they were convicted of, and, and somewhat of the appeals process. Um, so a lot of people have questions questions about that and and I will say it looks like in this country while there are a number of um, capital crimes usually if not always everyone on death row is there for a crime that involved killing someone mm -hmm. it, it might have been um, what whatever the case may be that there was there was some taking of life so we, we wanted to talk about the question tonight, just should we, do we believe in the death penalty? Andrew, which direction should we take with it? Well, I think when I started looking at this question, um, I think what makes sense to do is kind of look at what are, what are some views based on the scriptures that would support or give authorization for the use of the death penalty? Uh, and then are, are there any scriptures that maybe would would tend for us to maybe lean in the other direction or be cautious in how we apply it? So uh, I think that's where, where we might begin. Um, and, and one of the obvious first things I went to, you know, I think one that a lot of people go to when they're initially thinking about it is the old law. Um, because, you know, quite, quite well known to most people, uh, much of the old law, death was a punishment for a variety of sins against um, against the old law in, in the covenant with Israel, um, whether it was murder or adultery or even disobedience to parents, uh, yeah. punishable by death. Right. Uh, I know recently we talked about the Sabbath in a lesson, and Moses and the people had a question when the fellow broke the Sabbath, and they went to the Lord, and they said, what should we do? And the fellow ended up being stoned. It was a, a capital offense. So I don't think you're going to get any argument on that one that most people in answering this question they do go back to the old law and and I was thinking about that that idea and I don't think it's necessarily wrong to go back to the old law for the simple reason that the old law it, it was established they were governing a nation and and as we think about and, and that's the thing the old law is not the new law the old covenant's not the new covenant and frankly they were established somewhat for different um, different ends. I, I don't know, Bryce, what do you think? J just as far as here in the church, um, we're not going to take dissenters out and stone them, the, the last I checked. We don't usually do that. So, and, and it just, I, I was just thinking about it. We're not trying to govern a nation right. with the New Testament. So I wondered if you wanted to, to talk about that, the, just the fact that we're not trying to govern a nation. The Old Testament, they were governing a nation. Well, I mean, you're exactly right. I mean, the New Testament deals with individuals and our individual responsibilities toward God and our brethren and fellow man as well. 
And uh, so the new, the new covenant was designed for all nations with an understanding that all nations are different. And there's nothing in the new covenant that calls on nations to be joined together and united or follow a single law. It's all directed toward individual people. Yeah, ju- just in the sense of whosoever will may come and come into the kingdom. And it's going to be it's going to be different. Jesus, despite what a lot of folks think, is not the head of an earthly country or kingdom, even if it's good old U.S. of A. The Lord is, even though all authority has been given to me, he specifically talks about his kingdom, and his kingdom is not of this world. And the laws of the kingdom, frankly, it, just in the in the sense of you, you see that difference between the new and the old, and that in the old, you were you're governing a nation. So you had all these laws being implemented to govern the nation. Right. So if you want to start talking about, okay, governing the nation, because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the nation's laws. Okay, well, you're not going to find within the church, for lack of a better way of putting it, you're not going to find within the church those laws per se. Where you will find su- stuff like that is in the Old Testament. How did they deal with it? And even before the Mosaic Law, you go back to Genesis, and you have God's commands about if you kill someone, if you take someone's life, your life is going to be required. Right. So from the very beginning, you do have that notion Go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, you know what this makes me think of is we've been we've been studying in our Bible class recently about other even other law systems from the ancient world that were very similar in the Mosaic Law in that when there was an offense, the the point of this law as a civic law in a way was kind of to re- reestablish, I guess, the the balance of society. Um, you know, if there was a a lawless person, there was a, an imbalance in society in order to restore it usually the punishment reflected the nature of the crime. So in a lot of cases, if there was one who took someone's life, the punishment had to be um, being put to death. And that was true for the Mosaic Law. It was true for the Code of Hammurabi, um, one example that we've been talking about recently. It's true for pretty much most civilizations. The, the majority of old laws that you look at, and even a lot of laws today, in the case, like you said in the intro, in the cases where even in the United States we have capital punishment, it's usually in cases where um, someone is right. a killer. Right. And so I don't think you're going to get any question about the Old Testament. You no. see it throughout the Old Testament. No, but one one thing that I did want to mention yeah. as sort of a caveat to that, or I guess a, a secondary thing to throw in, there was something unique about the old law in that it was a law system directly from God, and that God was the God yeah. was the judge and the arbiter over the people of Israel. So in cases where there was disputes, or in cases where not all the facts were known, I mean, there were ways that God could even influence. The, the proceedings of, of trials, there were, um, I mean, I don't know all yeah, the, the details. Account of, the account of Achan right. as that was being revealed. Right. God had a hand in, in revealing to, to Joshua, you know, what what the fault was in the people and, and where the guilt lies. So uh, I don't think we can say that, you know, there's, there's somewhat a way in that the old law had a, a perfect judge over it. Um, God is still a perfect judge, but he's not judging over the civic uh, right. interactions of man in the same way that he was with Israel. It is interesting, even within the old law, to think about it, there was, the the penalty for the crime was proportional. That's the whole idea of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. There, So there was a proportionality to it. Um, there is also, the old law allowed for, sometimes things happened accidentally. And if if someone was killed by accident, it was not the same as if it was premeditated and intentional. Right. That was taken into account. There were the cities of refuge and there were provisions yeah. for that. Yeah. There was also due process within the old law. It, it was not to be done hastily. And you had, you had witnesses. You, you know, that's one of the points. And in thinking about the witnesses, one of the or one of the situations that a lot of times comes up is the account of the adulterous woman, or, or the woman who's brought to Jesus in in adultery. So someone go through and quickly what happens in that account. Go ahead, Brace. 
Um, well, give us the Reader's Digest <laughs> version. Not that anybody reads the Reader's Digest anymore. Well, <laughs> in John, the eighth chapter, we have the account of the adulterous woman who's brought to Jesus. Uh, she's brought by some of the Jewish people um, to Jesus because of his claims. And the statement that they make is that we have brought her to you because she was caught in the very act of adultery. And so they're claiming to be witnesses to the act right. and have brought her to Jesus to see how he is going to deal with this particular issue. Are you going to keep the law and therefore stone her or have us stone her in the way that she should be? Or are you going to not keep the law and allow her to go free? Because they're really not concerned about the woman at all. They're not. This is all about trying to find something against mm-hmm. Jesus. It's a test for Jesus. Yeah. As as we read frequently in the gospel sure. accounts, they came to him because they were testing him. Right. And so this is a test. And they bring her to him and explain the situation. And Jesus then takes some time and uh, looks at the situation and assesses things. And does some writing on the ground, I believe, in John the 8th chapter. And then he makes a simple statement, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And then he begins to stoop down and write again on the ground. And the account tells us that slowly, one by one, they all leave. And Jesus asks the woman, where are your accusers? And and she says, there are none. And he says, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. And so he releases her, um, even though, again, the Old Testament law is really clear that she's guilty of adultery and should be stoned. And and one of the points that people make is, if she was caught in the act, one question is, okay, where's the man? So that tells you right there, there's something funny about the whole situation. And the ones who who, who had a responsibility in these situations were the witnesses, this is where you have the verse, and it comes up more than once in the New Testament out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So you had that that idea of, because sometimes the Lord intervened directly, mm-hmm. like with Achan. Other times it's, okay, are there witnesses? And there was a due process and things like that. And if there were two or three witnesses, then we know what happened. But, and I think this is to Andrew's point, the Lord, Jesus knew, knew full well what she'd been doing. Right. And and his statement at the end of go and sin no more right. you know, seems to indicate that he knows she's guilty. He, he knew she was guilty, but but expected repentance out of her. Right. And, and But he does say, neither do I condemn you. Right. right. And, and that's the, the thing that, and that, that's the question. The Lord's mentality about, I did not come to condemn, I came to save. Mm-hmm. Does that mentality mean that that we should um, be against the death penalty? I think, it, would you say that kind of gets to the crux of it? I think it does in a way, and maybe it gets to the heart of sort of a person's individual, um, their, their individual reaction to it, maybe their personal feeling on it, um, because... You know, other verses we talked last week about the military and the authority of of there being militaries and Christians joining the military. And we brought up uh, Romans chapter 13, yeah. where it talks about, you know, the government's an agent against unrighteousness and they don't bear the sword in vain. Yeah. So there's there's evidence to say that that states and governments have the authority to enact the death penalty. Um, I would argue that authority is not the same as an obligation. Um, you may have the authority to do something, but choose not to implement it if you don't feel like there's there's adequate proof or adequate cause to do so. Yeah. Well, let's look at that Romans passage. Something sure. occurred to me in the last week um, as we as we've been preparing for this conversation. That passage in Romans thirteen: Let every soul. This is verse one. Let every be let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. The authorities that exist are appointed by God. Whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. That passage, it, it occurred to me, We, and I, I do the same thing. I think every time in, in my life I've quoted that passage, I, it's been a justification of the military. And I don't think that's what the passage is about. I don't think it's necessarily about a country's aggression towards another country 
What it's about is, does a country have the right to police its own population? That it's not necessarily about the military, that it's about what we would think of as the police. And and to get to that that idea of you you should know your own um your own population you, your own ho- however you want to put it you are policing your own people i think i think if you want to get maybe to the core of it um i mean for one in ancient rome police and military were typically yeah. the same job yeah um but also it's it's really speaking to an individual's responsibility to submit um even if even if in the case of rome an incredibly unjust government a lot of the time toward Christians. Um, there was a lot of violence and, and uh, sure. unrighteousness on the part of the Roman government, but still being subject as citizens, still being subject as, well, in some cases, you know, occupied citizens. Um, you know, Judea wasn't really a free state under Rome, right. but still still submitting to that and not, not rising up in violence uh, as, a, as a solution. Yeah, and, and I guess the reason I'm bringing that up, you know, I was thinking about the Lord's crucifixion. And certainly, concerning the Lord, had he done anything deserving of death? No. But we know there were several other individuals there. And to look at what the thief says, the thief on the left, I would assume, I don't know which one is on the left or the right, but the thief, when he's talking to the other thief, and he says, this man's done nothing wrong, he says, but we are receiving our due reward. He says, we indeed justly. And he recognized they that he himself and his um, the other fellow that they had done something worthy of death. And then you get to the fellow who was let go, and we actually know a little bit more about him because what does it call him? Doesn't it? Does it actually say like he's a notorious? So it uses some phrase like that that like he was an insurrectionist. One calls him insurrectionist, and then most point out that he was at least a murderer. Yeah, specifically. Right. And he was he was let go. So if you want to call that mercy, I'm not we're, we're usually not in the business of saying Pilate was too merciful, but he was let go. Mm-hmm. Okay, so was that a good thing? Well, I put it to you. <laughs> what do you think, Andrew? In the case of putting it up, putting him up against Jesus, as far as which one you're going to let go? No, no, I mean, no just him on his own. There's no competition there. But him on his own. Yeah. Um, a notorious insurrectionist guilty of murder being released into the general populace. Yeah, I think I think Are you, we good with that. <laughs> it's it's hard to say that that would be a, a justified release. Um, or it seemed pretty it seemed pretty clear, pretty confident in the scriptures right. that Barabbas was guilty. And and I think that's one reason I wanted to mention it, just because it is an obvious case with him that. And I think that's that's one thing about, uh, again, a nation's, a state's right to police its own people. Now, they, they should do a good job with it, and not saying that they're perfect, but with, with due process, and, and like you, the things you see in the old law, with things like witnesses and due process and, and taking things into account, um, mitigating factors, things like that, that you start getting to the point of, okay, like this fella, their Barabbas, he's he's notorious. This is who he is. And even Pilate was amazed, why in the world would you want me to release him? But he did. <laughs> and that says more about Pilate than anything. But anyway, it's an interesting situation. Well, I mean, Andrew's right that the passage in Romans 13, and again, like we said earlier, all the instructions in the New Testament are dealing primarily with an individual's responsibility, and therefore a significant portion of what's said in Romans 13 is dealing with my own personal responsibility toward the government. Right. But there are at least indirectly some things we learn about God's purpose for government. Right. Romans in the was not that are made. Yeah, Romans was not written was not written to Caesar and the government. It was written to the Christians Correct. dealing with the Roman government. Correct. But the interesting thing in noting that particular historical context is that Rome was not especially good at following what we would consider to be the law of God. Right. Um and yet sure. the the instruction that's given here and then reiterated again in in 1 Peter chapter 2 
is the Christian's responsibility to submit to the government. Right. So it, what's in question here is not so much whether the government is keeping and doing the right kinds of things. Right. It is our responsibility toward the government regardless of what how the government is acting because ultimately, verse 1, they have authority from God. Right. And it doesn't mean that God ordains specific governments or that right. he chooses those specific governments, but government as a whole, and in this context, the Roman government had the authority of God behind what it does. Right. And not only, verse 2, does it have the right to pol- police its own people and to deal with those who resist what is good and what's right, but they, in <clears throat> verse 4, he is a God's minister to you for good, but if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. Right. And the sword is frequently used throughout Scripture as kind of a metaphor, if you will, for death. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it, 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 it's not something we typically use today for executing people or killing people, right. but it was the means by which they did so in the Old Testament. Um, David and others who were kings um, were, were s- slew a lot of different people of various nations. And uh, so the sword was an instrument of death. And I think this passage in Romans 4 or 13, 4 makes it pretty clear that God has ordained government to have the authority to do that. And I, I think it's also important for us to go back a little bit in Romans 12 because the chapter divisions are <clears throat> relatively modern when we think about the New Testament or the Bible as a whole. Right. And the reality is sometimes my opinion is that those chapter divisions are <clears throat> a little uh, ambiguous and in some cases I think not even right. <clears throat> but this context that we're dealing with in Romans 13 really begins back in chapter 12 probably in verse 17, and again is dealing with our own individual responsibility toward those who wrong us. And it may shed some light on the question we were asking earlier about Jesus in John chapter 8 in both following the law from the standpoint of who's responsible for bringing the charge, who's responsible for the conviction, who's responsible for carrying out the execution. And and you know, the, their responsibility and all of that and his responsibility, though we recognize he is the judge and lawgiver, um, was he walking and living as such while he was here? Was he walking as one who was the, the giver of those things and therefore had the right to execute them in, in every instance? And I would suggest the answer to that question is no. But if you go back to verse 17, he begins by repay no one evil for evil, but have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. And then he makes this statement, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. There's a couple more verses in that chapter, but if you drop down to verse 4, it talks about him being... one who is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil at the end of verse four. So in in chapter 12, he kind of ends with the thought, don't avenge yourselves, leave place for the wrath of God. And then in verse four, he recognizes the government as essentially God's assigned instrument here on the earth to be the one to avenge wrongdoing and to bring about the wrath of God in the instances where evil occurs. I think that's that's one of the issues that people have, that that idea of he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. That means that there are evil people in the world and there are people who do wicked things. And frankly, sometimes that is hard to accept Right. that that there are people who are absolutely, positively wicked. And the Lord has established the kingdoms of men to try to deal with those situations because it is simply not good for society 
frankly, and it's hard for us as Christians because here we are in, in Romans 12 and we're like, we want to overcome evil with good. We want to bless those who persecute us. You know, we want to pray for those who spitefully use us. And yet here's God's instrument of vengeance, frankly, one of his instruments of vengeance. It's not the only one, but it's one of them. It's the government and its ability to deal with with evil people. And, and that is just hard to to get our minds wrapped around, that there are people who are evil. Yeah. Now, it may cause us to reflect and realize the wages of sin is death. And, you, you know, to look at, for example, the Gentiles that are spoken about in Romans chapter 1, and it talks about they were doing things that we ourselves have done before that are worthy of death. And that gets into... That, that gets into that territory of actually we've all done things mm -hmm. that are worthy of death in God's eyes. So it's not pleasant, but that's the, the truth of the matter. I, th I think something that you're getting at um, that I'm hearing, you know, all the way back at the, at the start, we said how the, the new covenant is not a civic law system. It's, right. it's commands given to the organization of the church right. and our personal spiritual walk as Christians. It's not a, it's not a system of government. It's not a system of organizing states. So the, the point that, that brace made in, in Romans, it says in as much as it depends on you live right. peaceably with all men. So there's, there's a personal application aspect of that. There's a spiritual sure. application, which is no matter how we're wronged or no matter what may wrong may be done against us, the personal spiritual responsibility is to show forgiveness and to live peaceably with people. And then there exists civic law and God allows civic laws to exist, but they're not, they're not written out of scripture directly. They come, from, it's understood that civic law depends a lot on the, the secular decision-making of, right. of mankind, but that exists as a means of like we talked about at the start, kind of resetting the balance of, of society um, whether it's a society based on the laws of God or not, there there needs to be a way to deal with um, wrongdoers. So both of those exist, um, and so it, it you know, I'm th is it in First Corinthians where it talks about you know the, the brothers having disputes with each other and yeah. the statement there is six. better better to be defrauded, you know, right. better to let yourself be wronged than to try to seek personal vengeance. Um, not to say that a government can't step in and. and execute judge justice where it's needed. Right. <clears throat> but when it comes to us, we shouldn't be, I feel like we shouldn't be gunning for vengeance or justice. Um, it's certainly not what we deserve when we look at, like you mentioned, the things right. that we've done that would also be deserving of punishment. And, and I, I don't think even in the old Testament, when someone was dealt with, it's a nice way of capital saying the capital punishment, it was not meant to be vengeance. It wasn't meant to be, you know, coming coming for them personally. It, it was, no, they've they've rebelled, and they may very well have a rebellious spirit, and, and that that sort of thing. In, in thinking about Rome and the Roman Empire, one of the interesting cases is Paul, because Paul's going to end up appealing to Caesar, and he's actually going to use the government system that he was under as a citizen of the Roman Empire. And within within that trial, he says, if I've done something worthy of death, he, he didn't mind dying. He recognized, now he, he makes the assertion, he's, he says, I haven't done anything worthy of right. death, frankly. But he, he throws that out there. He says, if I've done something that I'm guilty of, so be it. And that's, you know, the... <laughs> just the idea that there's wicked people and how do you how do you deal with that i was thinking of another passage over in hebrews and people are probably going to say what in the world is he reading this passage for but in hebrews when it talks about it's talking about resisting sin and dealing with the chastening of the lord but it uses the metaphor of how a father treats his son how a parent treats his child and I just wanted to, to think about the concept of, this is chapter 12 of Hebrews, verse 10. For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit. Now, my father's chastening, was it as perfect as the Lord's? Of course not. No. 
he did the best he could, usually. But I think any father would admit they've come up short even in that regard. Does that mean does that mean because of their imperfect discipline, does that mean they should give up on the on discipline? Just no. because they're just because it's imperfect. No. No. So the government and this is what one of the things that we, we have issues with are those who are wrongfully incarcerated. Even those who are wrongfully put to death. Does that mean we should throw does that mean we should disallow capital punishment? For one thing, we don't. That starts getting above our pay grade. Um, that's the government's decision. Now, whether we support that, that is up to us. Yeah, I think I think where I land on that is, um, we we should apply with caution. You know, and I think that's what the the Jews under the old law did when they had right. their own processes. They had limitations on when they right. could execute that judgment. Um, you know, proceed, proceed with caution. And if there's doubt, um, maybe don't be quick to judge in things where we can't, we can't know all. Yeah. Came across this passage. This is Ezekiel thirty three eleven, and we don't have time to look at everything in the context, but I, I just wanted to read it just cause I thought it's a, a powerful verse for this discussion. Um, this is what the Lord says. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? The Lord has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. What he wants the wicked to do is to turn from their ways. You know, but sometimes the wicked don't turn from their ways. Mm -hmm. Whether we're talking about spiritually or whether we're talking about the laws of the land, sometimes people are, sometimes people are evil. And that's one reason that the Lord has has allowed for the kingdoms of men. Yep. So it's it's a hard it's a hard question and it's not an easy question and I think you know Andrew to your point it's because you are you're dealing with life and death situations, right? And that's where you're having trouble with it just because it it starts it starts getting into God's territory a little bit. Right. For, for us to be the executors of judgment, um, you know, it it takes on a lot of responsibility. And if we're not careful, it could take on a level of arrogance, I think, where we start we start feeling powerful in ourselves. But, you know, I was thinking about this and, and one, one comfort, you know, we talked about the passage in John 8. There Jesus says, you know, I'm not here to judge while I'm here on earth. But what he does say is that I and the Father will judge. Right. So no matter what the, the judgments of man are, Right. Um, God is still the ultimate judge, and so, it's all going to come out. And it all it all comes It'll out. It all come out in the watch of Judgment Day. In the end, there's there's no need. There's no lack of witnesses in the final judgment. There's yeah. no need for earthly witnesses. Um, God knows all. So yeah. if if someone is not, uh, if someone doesn't get their justice on earth when they should, um, God knows. And if someone's wrongfully judged while here on this earth, uh, then then God knows that as well. So it, yeah, and, and to just look at Calvary. And you had those three men dying that day. One of those men was innocent. The father knew it. One of those men was guilty. He was still in paradise that day. Another man was guilty. I don't know what happened to him. Let the Lord sort that one out. But the nice thing is, even if we are wrongfully persecuted, the Lord, the Lord knows even if we are rightfully imprisoned and rightfully put to death, that does not mean that we can't turn from our sins. There may still be consequences for our actions, but we can we can die. Um, Paul, you know, better to he was looking forward to departing and being with the Lord. So it's um, anyway, it's it's a difficult topic. But it's something that a lot of folks have questions about. And I hope I hope our discussion has been beneficial for you. We appreciate you tuning in. Brace, thanks for joining us for, for this week's podcast. Thanks for inviting me. Yep, appreciate it. We'll have to do it again. Andrew, I hope you have a good week. Yep, same to you. All right. Appreciate everyone tuning in. Appreciate everyone having ears to hear. Feel free to share this podcast with folks you know. And we will see you, um, we will see you next week. Thanks for tuning in. Stop.